am so honored, Dr. Mike and Bond, to talk with you today about what expert therapists do and the core tasks of psychotherapy. Um, so welcome. Well, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for your interest. Of course, interest. of course. What inspired you to work in the field of mental health, rehab, recovery, and why is it important to you? Oh, for a number of years, 45 years, I was a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Mm -hmm. And during this period, I had, I had an opportunity to work with all varied populations. My original work at the University of Illinois started off with studying thought disorders in schizophrenics. Mm. I then went, I had developed their various kinds of self-instructional cognitive behavioral procedures that had some problem some promise as an editing. I then uh, moved to the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, where our initial work was once again, working on cognitive behavioral interventions with hyperactive children, adults who had impulse control. And then eventually I ended up working on people who've had trauma experiences, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I've had over the course of my career, a variety of clinical populations. I've That's worked amazing. With. Yeah. Yeah. Could you share your insights on the fundamental skills that you believe define an expert therapist in the field of psychotherapy? What do you think is the most important quality for a therapist to have? Well, clearly the research indicates that the quality and nature of the therapeutic alliance is three to four times more important than the specific intervention that's being used. So the one characteristic is the degree to which the therapist is able to develop, establish, maintain, and most importantly, monitor on a session by session basis, the quality of their therapeutic alliance with the client. The therapist needs to be culturally sensitive, needs to be gender sensitive and age related in formulating the nature of the problem with the client. The second characteristic that I think is clearly important is to meet the patient where he or she is at. And this means that we have developed at various times a case conceptualization it turns out that therapists who uh, vary their intervention in the characteristics, meaning that of the client, are more effective than those who are showing a great deal of fidelity to a specific treatment protocol. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, it is clearly, critically important that the therapist and the patient develop some sense of hope and the research by uh, a number of investigators indicate that having collaborative goal setting yep. is a very valuable tool in nurturing hope for the client. Those are three important elements. I could enumerate others, but those are the yeah. three that I think are critical. Yeah, that collaborative approach is certainly one that I've used throughout my career, and it really does do wonders and is imperative as part of the process. So in your extensive yeah. experience, what core tasks of psychotherapy do you find most critical for facilitating meaningful change? How would somebody know that their therapist and they are a good match? Clearly, the answer to that question is to ask the patient. You know, the question is, how does one ask? So I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Scott Miller, mm -hmm. Barry Duncan, Cheryl Chow, and there. They've developed what is called feedback-informed treatment. Yeah. And they have developed a variety of self-report measures, mm -hmm. quick kinds of scales that could be used at the end of each therapy session that tries to enumerate whether the 
is a good fit between the patient and the therapist. I have developed two legacy courses of what I characterize as the experts of doing therapy. Mm -hmm. These are uh, two 10-hour sessions. And in there, I have included the art of questioning. So if you do not want to ascertain the degree of fit using some kind of rating scale, there are a number of questions that you could ask of your client or should be asked at the end of each session. And these questions deal with the degree to which the client felt that they were heard and respected, that they felt that the session address the issues that they want to address during that thing. There are questions that look, ask how and when the client is going to apply what he or she learned that session. Therapists cannot leave out or fail to address the issue of generalization, which is a key element yeah. what needs to go on before during and after the training of a skill that the patient is likely to use and then there is need in subsequent sessions for the therapist to ask the patient on a regular basis the degree to which that particular skill makes a difference mm-hmm. i'll just add one more thing if i might absolutely The key question that I tend to ask my client is the following. I say to my clients, let me ask you something a bit different, perhaps even unusual. Mm -hmm. Do you, the client, ever find yourself out there in your day-to-day experience asking yourself the questions that we ask each other right here? Mm. So it is my job to try and have the client take my voice with them. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of my favorite questions because I want the client to recognize that what's going on in the therapy session is a kind of modeling of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to put myself out of business. I want them to become, in some sense, their own Mm -hmm. therapist. So therefore, asking the questions do they ever find themselves asking what we ask each other Mm -hmm. right then is in fact one of the higher mental mental cognitive skills that I need them Mm -hmm. to develop. Yeah. Yeah. That tool in and of itself has been formative in my approach and throughout my career. And it's 100% thanks to your teachings and your research. So absolutely. When you talk about different populations and then therapeutic alliances, I had never seen a therapist until I was 47 years old. And that's when I, in recovery terms, I hit my bottom and I started my recovery. And it was amazing, this woman in three sessions that she really, really understood me and I felt safe with her and I felt like she understood me How challenging is it, especially with these different populations and people that have experienced a lot of trauma and violence, if you've got a clinician that maybe grew up very, very differently, right? Maybe middle, upper class, maybe elite private schools, et cetera. I don't want to use the term street cred, but how how do those clinicians, how are they trained to be able to connect with someone who is from such a different environment? That seems really hard. I think that's a really good question. First of all, I should note that I've written a book called Treatment of Individuals with Substance Abuse that's out there that addresses many of the kinds of questions that you have to ask. Let me see if I can direct the answer directly to your question. I think that an effective therapist, no matter what their background, is effective insofar as they are able to show accurate empathy. So they may not have a similar exact problem as you did, but they're able to identify with the pain, the the emotional distress with the past background that you have experienced. 
and they need to communicate that both verbally and non-verbally during that first initial session. It turns out that the quality and nature of the, the initial therapeutic alliance by the third session is highly predictive of how well they're going to do over the rest of it. So the fact that this therapist, whoever he or she may have been, were able to communicate that with you. The second element is that not only do they need accurate empathy, they have to be able to engender a kind of sense of trust that you are going to be able to convey whatever the pain you have, the experiences you've had, and that they will respect, that they will honor it. And moreover, that inherent in their communication to you is not only a sensitivity to their risk factors, but to the protective factors. So the fact that at 47 you had, quote unquote, hit bottom, means that you have come to recognize the sense of resilience and strengths that you had. So the fact that she's able to demonstrate accurate empathy, that she's able to engender a kind of trusting enjoyment, and thirdly, that she's able to give you hope in highlighting for you. And I would hope that this therapist would have asked you, how did you come to treatment now? Mm -hmm. You know, after all of these years, share with me, the therapist, how you came to be in this office with me. And therefore, your answer to that question will enable me as a therapist, even though I haven't had the exact same experience, to be able to fit with you, I hope. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's perfect. It's beautiful. It makes complete sense. Dr. Meigenbaum, it makes me think. So I use the 12 steps, right? I'm sure you're familiar okay. with the 12 steps from Alcoholics Very Anonymous. And many people recover with a sponsor. And a sponsor yes. is an amateur therapist in many ways. And what we're coached to do as a sponsor, don't preach, don't tell, just share your experience, strength, and hope. Right. And when I can share how scared I was when I was in the throes of addiction and what happened to me, et cetera, you can see someone engaging because I think they identify and they see a similarity, which lets them feel at ease. Yeah. And I'm sure you're familiar with the sponsor relationship, right? Yeah, I am. And just like therapists, there are really good sponsors and poor sponsors. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So my at really 100 I become There's really no interested there. in yeah, yeah. the quality yeah. and nature of therapeutic alliance. I've spent many years, in fact, I'm right now in the midst of training psychotherapists in mm -hmm. China. I assume Chinese psychotherapists. And the one kind of caution that I want to highlight, because I've lectured on this and written about it, is that the field of psychotherapy is filled with bullshit <laughs> or what I call hype or exaggerated claims of efficacy. Mm -hmm. And the last year or so, year and a half ago, uh, with a colleague named Scott Lennerfeld, we wrote an article on how to spot hype mm -hmm. in the field of psychotherapy. And if your listeners go to... Uh, the agency I run, the, uh, the if they go to the Melissa Institute for Violence Prevention, mm -hmm. the www.melissainstitute.org, they will be able to read this hype article and become a more critical consumer. Mm -hmm. So there's certain kind of advice that I think a sponsor should give you in terms of relapse prevention, warning signs, better cognitive skills that you need. So many of the same personal attributes that make for an effective therapist make for an effective mm -hmm. sponsor. And not everyone should become a therapist. Not everyone should become mm -hmm. a sponsor. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and there's, there's no barriers. Yeah. And there's no barriers to entry or there's limited barriers to entry, unfortunately, mm -hmm. for the sponsor. Um, so, Thanks so much. Yeah. That was really helpful.
Yeah, they, the sponsor should undergo some training. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there's a whole set of procedures called motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that sponsors go through that because one of the major tenets of motivational interviewing is to avoid argumentation. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to argue you out of your addictive substances. Okay? They need to have you explore the discrepancy between how your life is now and how you would like it to be. They need to support your own self-efficacy when you, in fact, are tempted and no longer engaged in your addictive behavior. They need to ask you questions of how or what. How did you do that? What happened? They need to get you to have some personal agency. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that both therapists and sponsors will go through that kind of training. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great segue for one of my other questions about common misconceptions that about the work that therapists do and how they might differ from the actual reality of practice. I think that there are certain kinds of skills that therapists need that I've commented on and, and they have to be sort of person centered. Mm -hmm. I think the art of questioning is really your most valuable tool. If you're a clinician, a therapist, the clinician needs compassionate curiosity to your colleague. I need to understand what and how he developed his addiction. What purpose did it serve? If he's come to the decision to seek help, how did he come back? So what and how did he make that decision? Uh, what would he like to see? How could I be of help to mm -hmm. him? So my compassionate curiosity is what I want to convey to my clients. Mm -hmm. So a misconception could be that you need to have experienced what I, the client, or another person, the client has gone through. But to your point, you're saying that as long as that rapport and that passionate curiosity is translated into the sessions to be able to explore the person's life, then yeah. we're starting to make some distance and go the long, long journey. Yeah, and, it's, and mostly related to that is some clients come in and have the expectation of the therapist that they're going to tell them what mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And I've come to a phrase called therapists should not become surrogate frontal lobes <laughs> for it. the client. Yeah. Surrogate frontal lobes. It's not my job to tell the patient what to do. Yeah. Often the patient knows what to do, but they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So I have to explore with the patient what are the potential barriers or obstacles that are getting in the way. Mm -hmm. What are the nature of the beliefs, the emotional feelings that are hijacking the frontal lobe? And I need them to become more aware. I need them to become their own therapist rather than just depend upon me giving them advice. Mm -hmm. So with that, you mentioned, and I want to go back to this, that you're extensively training people and you're training people in China right now. Tell us a little bit more about that and what yeah. that program involves and how you're integrating new technologies and approaches into your training methods. I wrote a book called Roadmap to Resilience. Mm -hmm. I developed two legacy courses. About a year and a half ago, my wife was killed and I have made that material available for free on mm -hmm. the internet. So if people go to roadmap to resilience dot wordpress dot com, maybe you could even yeah. type that out. Mm -hmm. That particular book has been downloaded by fifty thousand visitors in one hundred and thirty eight countries, mm -hmm. and therefore, this in part giving this away has led to my participation in doing Zoom lectures for individuals all over. Mm -hmm. I recently gave a workshop to a Romanian 
mental health workers who were taking in Ukrainian victims. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the work in China has been really interesting. Part of my goal there is to make sure that all the hype that comes out of Western psychology and psychotherapy does not seep its mm -hmm. way into China. I want to guard them from all of that exists in the West. So that has been really interesting because the Institute is, the Melissa Institute is in Miami. Mm -hmm. We have dealt with people from a variety of Caribbean and South American cultures and so forth. I've had projects with native Indian populations mm -hmm. and so forth. So I'm really very culturally minded. And I think the combination of my work on cognitive behavior therapy and my sensitivity to cultural factors have led me to be invited to conduct this training mm -hmm. in uh, China. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. It's the best part. Mm -hmm. I recently had the Chinese therapist sing happy birthday to me in Chinese. Oh, that's wonderful. I love it. Oh, that's funny. I'm going to that's ask you a question. To say. That's, that, that's awesome. Yeah, your, your a joy and interest in working with different populations mm -hmm. knows no ends. I'd like to ask you... What have you observed culturally about the stigma yes. of mental health in the West and in the East? And I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts there. Well, there are all marked variability. So some individuals are really living in a goldfish bowl. Both There are more differences within a culture than there are between cultures. That's really quite interesting. Um, one of the things I've come to appreciate, I'll get directly to your question, but one of the things I came to appreciate is that clinical problems are pretty uniform across cultures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in China, okay, most of the therapists I'm training are female. And they're female in their 20s, right? Mm -hmm. And as I pointed out to them, they all have Jewish mothers, even though they're in China. Because their mother wants to know when they're getting married, when they're going to have a baby. It's, it's a uniform kind of problem. When domestic violence occurs all over, people are exposed to natural and other kinds of traumatic experiences. So within each culture, there is often a stigma, an avoidance of other people knowing that they are seeking mm -hmm. help. I wouldn't want to characterize it as West versus East, per se. Uh, one could find in many small towns in the United States, which are called goldfish bowls, where everybody knows everybody, where avoidance of seeking help or avoidance of having that go public is noted. I'm not sure if I'm getting close to your concerns. Clearly, the West is more individually oriented and the East is much more group oriented. Mm -hmm. And the issues of trust, expectations vary across cultures. For example, in, in China, a community might lock, be locked down because of COVID mm -hmm. and you are confined to your house. Now, if you deviate and go out of the house, significant others in that building or family members may even report you to authorities, right? So a really interesting question is if you go to see a therapist and you happen to be gay in China, do you trust the therapist not to report you to the mm -hmm, authorities? Mm -hmm. Whereas here, the notion is whatever I talk to my therapist will stay within that room. So the notion of therapeutic alliance, trust, and so forth may vary across mm -hmm. cultures, depending upon all of the other kinds of societal expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been proven to me to be a real challenge in, in the training of, of therapists, agree to which the client feels that they could trust for them. 
The same thing would apply to your addiction mm -hmm. treatment. You wouldn't want anyone else, like your employer or others, to know about your problem. So you may be very sensitive as to whether you can really share this relation whether you may have experienced some trauma from a family member and you want to make sure that the therapist is not going to go public with that information. I think this is a uniform problem in the area mm -hmm. of psychotherapy. Yeah. What would you say therapists should do to tailor those core tasks of psychotherapy to meet the needs of such diverse populations? Well, at least in, in my own domain, I try to explain to the patient early on in treatment what we know about psychotherapy. I actually have a conversation with the patient that the, the degree, the research indicates that the degree of fit between me and the patient is critical. That how well they feel heard, understood, the degree to which we could mutually engage in kind of hopeful solutions mm -hmm. to their problems is critical. Therefore, I will be asking you, the patient, on a session-by-session -session basis to please share with me, the therapist, how well we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know I will be as honest as possible as a therapist, but I expect you, the patient, to also have a mutual transaction of being honest with me on mm -hmm. how it's going. Does this make yes, sense absolutely. to you? Yeah. So I convey to the client, does this make mm -hmm. sense to him or her in order that they can understand why we need to have a transparent interaction? I'm sure your colleague here had that opportunity with regard to his therapist that made such a big impact early on mm -hmm. that you could sort of be able to tell the therapist when they're way off, yeah. when they're way on, whether you see them as being helpful or not. Right. That correction element is so important. And I think it's so valuable to encourage the ability for the client to speak to that, right. And to say, okay, no, I am not on track, or yes, I am on track, or this is what I need to focus on more of. Cliff, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I should warn you that in about 10 minutes, I have my physical. Okay, not a problem, coming. not a problem. We'll do a couple more questions. I recently, I recently had heart oh, failure. Sorry to hear that. And they're now, doing this. Yeah. Treatment. I'm glad yeah. that you, I mean, you yourself are in recovery right now as well. And yeah, I sure am. Yeah, I sure am. I, uh, two months ago, my heart stopped oh my for goodness. 14 minutes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I, I try to live with resilience. I will. Yeah. I, I'm so glad that you're, you know, here still and sharing with us all of this valuable information. What would you say, you would recommend for therapists to do to continue to develop their expertise and remain effective? And what should clients look for well, if their therapist you know, doing? I, 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 without tuning my horn, before I had mm -hmm. this heart failure, I finished mm -hmm. legacy courses, mm -hmm. each for 10 hours. And if they, if your listening audience goes to www.melissainstitute, all mm -hmm. one word, mm -hmm. .org, they will be able to register for my legacy okay. courses. And in these, the first 10 are the core task of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. The second 10 is how to apply these core tasks to specific clinical populations, mm -hmm. individuals who have PTSD or substance abuse or anger problem. There's a whole section there on how to integrate spirituality and psychotherapy, yeah. which is a major okay. domain. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage your listeners, if they want more of the same, to go to the 
Melissa Institute and register for the the courses. Each are ten hours long, and I should let let your audience know that the proceeds of the ten courses are going to the Melissa Institute, not to me directly, in memory of my deceased mm-hmm. wife. We were married for fifty eight wow. years. And she deserves a great deal of credit for all that I have achieved. Thank you for your interest and information, and I hope this is helpful to you. Absolutely, audience. absolutely. No, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Mike and Bond. It really is an honor. Dr. Mike and Bond, you know, again, as someone in long-term recovery, and I, I built a recovery program uh, that is working for me today, and hopefully that continues. As I mentioned, part of it was the 12 steps, but a big part of it also was positive psychology. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Martin Seligman and his work with the PERMA framework. And it's interesting that is a relatively new field, late 90s, 2000-ish. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, an intentional approach to designing a life high in well-being. I know that there's uh, some of the traditional uh, psychologists that came up through the 60s and 70s. There's different opinions on positive psychology. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, very quickly, there's an overlap between the kind of core tasks that I enumerate in my Roadmap to Resilience book and some of the techniques that are evident in positive psychology. That's really a chapter heading, positive psychology. So a lot of different things fall under it. And this is where I think the hype becomes a Mm -hmm. critical issue. Let me give you one example. There is a kind of advocation of a a treatment called mindfulness training. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, it turns out that George Bonanno, who's Mm -hmm. written a book Mm -hmm. called The End of Trauma, has reviewed studies that indicate that mindfulness actually make people worse. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, do positive psychologists just, well, there's the EMDR. Everybody mm-hmm. points to 96 different things you could do. I uh, recently critiqued, if you go on to the hype articles, um, some of the work of Bessel van der Kolk. His book has been on the New York Times bestseller, The Body Keeps Score, for 200 weeks. Well, it turns out there isn't as much substance to what he offers as others so under positive psychology there are certain things that may work uh, others don't i would take it with a grain of salt and not really just follow all of the guides therein go to my consumer's guide on article on how to spot hype Mm -hmm. and see if the positive psychology advocates are in fact exaggerating their claims of efficacy, whether they have gurus who endorse it, whether they have thick, thin skin, whether there's any evidence for it. I can go on and on. This is my favorite topic, is to get people to be critical consumers. Yeah. So in the same way that you are able to identify certain kinds of sponsors who are helpful versus those who aren't, they all fall under sponsorship is something everyone should have. Well, it depends on the sponsor. Mm-hmm. There's certain yeah, one out of that. Yeah, I, I, that. yeah, so mm-hmm. my attitude is be a critical consumer. Yeah. Don't just accept other people's endorsements. Yeah. What a privilege. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Okay, okay take care.